<clears throat> I was going to walk my dog, but there's a huge storm coming. It looks like it's going to be violent. So I'll just stay here for a little while. Um, so we're going to get into the mind has no sex, but first I'm setting my goals like the cards asked me to, you know. So, something cool showed up on my Facebook feed. Excuse me, I just ate. <clears throat> and a nursing home in North Carolina wants people to pen pal the residents. So I'm doing one of I'm doing one of those. <clears throat> there's a ton. There's a lot of people. And if I really wanted to, I would write to each one, but I'll be spreading myself like butter and it, you know, with the, the intention and the care that I want to provide won't be as good. So I just chose one person and her name is Florence and I chose it because her name's French. And also because it reminds her, she reminds me of Florence in the Machine. So, so that makes me happy. Um, that puts me in a good mood. <clears throat> so let's see what else did I have to do? I had to write something else, a note to myself. Oh yeah, I remember October. Someone's birthday, apparently. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> Halloween's the 31st, and it's going to be a full moon. And what full moon is it? Hunter's moon, harvest and hunter moon. Anyways, um, so yes, in that moon, it's Samhain, which is a secret <clears throat> pagan holiday. You know, just mm. just setting a reminder for myself. And we'll get into the book right now. Anyways, <clears throat> we're not going walkies. It's literally going to thunder and lightning. 
crazy dog. All right, so the mind has no sex. And also another reason why I bought this was because it has a skeleton of a woman, female, and uh, some bird. It looks like an ostrich. And I thought that was pretty cool. Harvard University Press, Cambridge, Massachusetts, London, England, for Robert. Acknowledgements. I don't usually read the acknowledgements. Um, introduction. Should probably get a pillow, but whatever. Uh, forgive me for my elementary French. Le spirit na point du sexo. Is that how you say it? I don't know. When the ardent Cardison Poulian issued this declaration, and I'm already gonna have to look up a word. What is a Cardison? <laughs> is that his name? Relating to Descartes and his ideas. Oh, he's philosopher, right? Okay. I'm gonna this. The process of reading for me is long, but this is how you educate yourself. So, Declaration that the mind has no sex, he based his argument on the new science of anatomy. <clears throat> I kind of want to just use one color, and I think that color is going to be purple. Um, he based his argument on the new science of anatomy. Women have sense organs similar to men's and brains with the same power of reason and imagination. So why, he asked, should they not be equal, the equals of men serving as professors, judges, or the court, military officers, or ambassadors. Yeah. Why? Okay, so Poulain's Pule words reverberated across all of Europe. In 1673, he was like, why aren't women in science? A woman chemist cited them in, in 1674 to defend her publication, a literally, a literal, literal, liter, literary man invoked them in 1884 in support of women's admission to the Académie Française. I can say that. French Academy. Hmm. This popular refrain did not go unchallenged, however. In, in the days preceding the French Revolution, anatomists and medical doctors asserted that the mind does indeed have sex and that sex extends through more or less perceptible nuances into every part of the body, including the brain. William Way Waywell in 1834, in the same paper in which he coined them, the term scientist, assured his readers that notwithstanding all the dreams of theorists, there is a sex in the in minds. Women, so these scholars taught, are essentially different from men, and female nature destines women. The sex as they were often called for, li for lives as mothers confined to hearth and home.
I'm not gonna, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. The question of male and female equality in the sphere of intellect has proved an enduring one. Sweet baby Jesus, no words. <laughs> yeah. Tell me about it, tell me about it. <clears throat> Nowadays we ask, as have others before us, why are there so few women scientists? Whatever. In the seventh century, the English natural philosopher, Margaret Cavendish spoke for many when she wrote, the woman's brains are simply cold, too cold and soft to sustain rigorous thoughts. And I think she was being sarcastic because it's in quotes, so you know, too cold and too soft. <clears throat> the alleged defect in women's minds has changed over time, or actually the person who wrote this is just, you know. In the late 18th century, the female cranial cavity was supposed to be too small to hold powerful brains. In the late 19th century, the small, um, Sorry, the exercise of women's brains was said to shrivel their ovaries. In our own century, peculiarity, peculiarities in the right hemisphere supposedly make women unable to visualize spatial relations. Yeah, I kind of have trouble with that. But that's something you can learn, lady. Doesn't mean it's definitive. Shrivel my ovaries, please. Right. <clears throat> it seems unnecessary, however, to jump to rigid, rigid, rigidly biological explanations when one considers the obstacles that have been thrown in women's paths. For centuries, women were barred from the academies and universities for no reason other than their sex. Those few who were able to succeed in science often fa failed to enjoy the recognition of that office. Mary Curie, the first person ever to win two Nobel Prizes, was denied membership in the prestigious Academy de, Cien de Ciencias. Academy de Ciencias. I don't know how to say that in French. In 1911, because she was a woman, a woman was not elected to full membership in the academy until 1979, more than 300 years after it first opened its doors. Perhaps we should be asking a different question. Why are there so few women scientists that we know about? Exactly. Why? I know the reason why. Poor Paul. French. Okay. Perhaps women have been scientists in the past, but their stories have not been remembered. Exactly. I'm sure there were shit tons, of, I mean, a lot of women scientists. Or perhaps women have dominated certain fields, but these fields have not been recognized as science. A fly almost suicided in my mouth. <coughs> Where'd it go? Oh, yes, I have food all over me. Anyways, <laughs> uh, perhaps women have dominated certain fields, blah, blah, blah. As long as 1830, the German physician Christian Harles, Harles lamented the long standing gap in history of the natural sciences. There has been no historical and evaluative survey of all women, all the women who, from the earliest times until our own, have distinguished themselves in the various sciences. How long has the problem of women in science been a problem? Forever. How many times has the battle been fought, lost, and then forgotten? Science is not an accumulative, cumulative inter enterprise. The history of science is, such, is as much about the loss of traditions as it is about the creation of new ones. So this is uh, this sentence right here. 
just the how long has the problem of women in science been a problem? How many times has the battle, battle been fought, lost, and forgotten? Um, this reminds me of current events that are going on with the Black Lives Matters movement. This has literally been reoccurring. four centuries, the same thing coming back. Hey, this is a problem, let's fix it. Going back and back and back, you know, like, and people forget, right? I don't forget. Anyways, what else was I doing? Oh yes, the definition of cumulative. I want to know the actual definition. Um, you know, and like I mentioned, the universe is, works in funny, funny ways. So when something isn't resolved, it's always gonna come back up. <sighs> Animal children. I'm just saying that because Kaiza has made a bed out of one of my shrines. And she probably has wrecked it, but it's okay. My purpose in this book is to explore the long-standing quarrel between science and Western culture as defined as femininity. What is it about being a woman that has made men of science fearful of female intrusion? <laughs> boobs, distractions. Uh, actually, I read toxic masculinity pretty much. Um, okay, I was gonna say something. What is it about science that has made it success susceptible to such fears? Uh, it's not the only thing. To answer these questions, I analyzed the rise of modern science in Europe in the 17th and 18th centuries, focusing especially on the circumstances, circumstances that led to the exclusion of women. In the 17th century, science was a young enterprise forging new ideas and institutions. Men of science at this time can be seen as standing at a fork in the road. They could either sweep away the traditions of the medieval past and welcome women as full participants, or they could reaffirm past prejudice and continue to exclude women from science. What were the social, political, and intellectual circumstances that directed science down one road? What was the cultural cost of that journey? Men. I'll be right back. I need a pillow for my booty. something some cushion and also I have to crack my back but <clears throat> the project of writing histories of women in science is not an entirely new one as early as 1405 Christine du Pizan asked if women had made original contributions in arts and sciences I realize that you are able to cite numerous and frequent cases of women learned in the sciences and the arts, but I would then ask whether you know of any women who have themselves discovered any new arts and sciences, which have hitherto not been discovered or known, for it is not such a great feat of mastery to study and learn some field of knowledge already discovered by someone else, as it is to discover by oneself some new and unknown thing. I don't 
thinking. No comment. Anyways, de Pizan, ladies, lady reason, gave the answer of many modern histo historians of women. Rest assured, dear friend, that many great and no no Jesus. noteworthy sciences and arts have been discovered through the understanding and sub subsli I, oh my god, this book is going to kill me, of women, both in cognitive uh, speculation demonstrated in writing and in arts manifested in manual works of labor. Dupizan, celebration of the heritage of intellectual women was not unique. The first major histories were presented in the form of encyclopedias. Man, I had encyclopedias, I remember that. From Giovanni Bocciaccio, the Clarisse Mouliebus, Mouliebus, yeah, French. He's Italian, but he's his thing is French. Clarice Mouliebus, 1355, 1359. Through the 18th century, the names of women learned in the arts and scientists were collected largely in an attempt to prove that they were indeed more accomplished women than had been previously imagined. It was not until the late 18th century, however, that the first encyclopedia appeared devoted exclusively to the history of women's achievements in natural sciences. <clears throat> In 1786, the French astronomer Jérôme de Lalonde included in his Astronomie du Dames, um, that's very nice, the first short history of women astronomers. Thank you, Jérôme. Okay. And 50 years later, in his Verdien Studer Frauen, oh God, this is German. Why are you switching it up on me? It's French, and then Verdien Studer Frauen. I'm sorry. Christian, <laughs> Christian Harless emphasized that, oh, it's it's because it's Christian. Okay. Christian Harless emphasized that both men and women are capable of doing science. Very nice. It is not exclusively for the man to research nature, to penetrate her creations with a keen eye, and to enjoy her charms with unending passion. Sensitive women may also perceive her endless magic. I like this guy, Christian. He has a way with words. Hmm. Very nice. Going back from German to French is kind of tricky. <clears throat> At the same time, Harless identified what he thought were significant differences between men's and women's relationship to nature. Man, he wrote, as soon as, as he's moved by the spirit, searches to uncover causes underlying appearances, <clears throat> seeking to discover laws in life and nature. Women, by contrast, search, searches nature over for expressions of love. This, he concluded, is the more natural, most beautiful way to approach the external world. I don't say anything wrong with that because, you know, you need two different yin and yang, you know. The European women's movement of the 1880s and 1920s drew attention once again to the question of women's ability to contribute to the sciences. Sciences, In 1888, a journal entitled Le Rouf Scientifique du Femmes, mm -hmm. so French, wait, that's not French, never mind. <laughs> once again to the question of women, blah, blah, blah was founded in Paris. In 1894, the St. Simonians in Paris held that the first conference in modern times on women in science uh, from 
which grew Alphonse Rebier's book, Le Femmes dans le Sciences. That same year, Elise Olens Olenser published her Leistungen der Deutschen Frau. Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Interesting, interesting. At least my French is a little better than my German, right? I don't know. Uh, I could understand what that, I don't know what Leistungen is, but Deutsch, Deutsch und Frau, the German, oh, achievements of the German woman. Okay, cool. Why do you have the translation of the German, but you don't have the translation of the French? Even though I know what it says, but... All right. <clears throat> In which she paid close attention to women's scientific achievements. By this time, however, the encyclopedia format employed in these books no longer served as an effective strategy for pro proving that women had indeed been great scientists. Anti-feminists, such as Gino Lorei, in Italy pointed out that even if there was there were enough distinguished women to fill 300 pages, an equivalent project from men would run to 3,000 pages. What woman, Loria asked, can rival Pyth Pythagoras or Archimedes or Newton or Leib Leibniz? He sounds pretentious, right? In response to this kind of criticism, European and American feminists turned from the strategy, strategy of emphasizing the achievements of exceptional women and began to emphasize instead the barriers to women's participation in science. Smart. I need to make a note <laughs> for my game, my prototype. Should we do green? Not to purple. Um, you know, part of learning and educating yourself, you realize that education is everywhere. Learning is everywhere, not just pertaining to that particular subject that you're studying. So through this book, that sentence is going to be added to the homelessness uh, prototype that I have. Because it's educational and I want to provide emphasis on the barriers that people have when they become homeless. So then it could be relatable, you know what I mean? You know what I mean, jelly bean? You know, that's why when people tell me they have an education degree, I'm like, not to diminish what they've studied, but like, it's a lifelong, like education is lifelong. Like you can't just go to school and be like, yeah, I have an education degree. I'm educated, you know, like it doesn't work. I don't know, whatever. Um, And I mentioned it before, people go to school here in America and they think that after they get to their degree, they never have to learn ever again. And that's kind of like, meh. Um, that's not the point of being educated. It's to participate.
And I'm going to keep this out because uh, I might have to write more as we read. <clears throat> the first detailed work of this sort was published in America in 1913 by H.J. Mozans, a pseudonym for the Catholic priest J.A. Zan, under the title Women in Science. It was an impassioned attempt to show that whatever women have achieved in sciences has been through defiance of that conventional code which compelled them to confine their activities to the ordinary duties of the household. Mozan's, Mozan urged women to join the scientific ent enterprise and thereby unleash half the energies of humanity he expected each woman to act as Beatrice, inspiring her own Dante to achieve his full potential. In this way, man and women would complement each other and together form a perfect adrogene. Only then would that world enter a new golden age, the age of science and perfect womanhood. Hmm which is basically talking about um, the divine feminine and divine masculine spiritually sense, like that type of thing. What was I gonna write down? Oh, yeah, the word androgyne. I've never seen that. Dragonous individual. Dragonous. Okay. The works of de Pizan, Harless, Ol Olenser, Rebier, and Mozan are landmarks in the field of history of women in science. Yet it should be noted that these authors who wrote about outsiders were also themselves by and large outsiders. Within the academy, as might be expected, the study of women in science was no more welcome than the women than were women scientists. Despite scattered interests since the time of Christine, Christine Pizan, de Pizan, records of women uh, contributions did not become part of historical canon, nor was this picture to change with the emergence of the modern dis discipline of the history of science in 1920s, 1930s. <clears throat> this new field purporting to study the relation, the relation between science and society did not consider the role of women in science. What a surprise. Even the women working in that field, Marie Boas Hall, Martha Ornstein, and Dorothy Stimson paid little attention to women's participation in the science. None of the major theorists exploring the social origins of modern science, Robert Merton, Edgar Zilsel, Boris Hessen, For some reason, the name Hessen just like kind of intrigued me. I've heard it before. It's in Frankfurt. that down. <laughs> um, 
I wanted to move to Frankfurt, Germany for a very long time while I was in college. But, you know. All right. Made any mention of women, historians studied per participation in science from many important vantage points, religious affiliation, class, age, vocation, but ignored enti entirely questions of gender. Merton, for example, in his pioneering work on 17th century English science pointed out that 62% of the initial membership of Royal Society were Puritan. He did not, however, explore the implications of the even more striking fact that the early membership in the Royal Society and indeed in all 17th century academies of science was 100% male. How boring. It's like sausage party. <laughs> Since the 1970s with increasing numbers of women entering both sciences and the historical profession, there had been a steadily growing interest in history and philosophy of women in science. Women scientists have contributed thoughtful autobiographies giving firsthand accounts of their struggles to make a mark in science. Intellectual biographies have appeared of Sophie Germain, Mary Somerville, Sophia Kovaleskia, and Clemens Royer. I've never heard of it. I had to look them up. my ignorance. <clears throat> These books, uh, obviously, it's not my fault. They're barriers to this information. Um, these books assess, assess the contributions of women to science and address an important set of questions. What sparked their interest in science? How did they obtain access to the tools and techniques of science? How did they make their scientist, scientific res discoveries? What recognition did these achievements receive in broader community of scholars? <coughs> I apologize for my hiccups. <clears throat> the person who wrote this, who had this book, wrote something over Spart. Kuzo. I don't know. A Kuzo? I don't know. It's weird. I don't know. All right. <clears throat> Much of this work fits the history of great men mold, with women simply uh, substituted for men. One problem with this brand of history is that if it often retains the male norm as the measure of excellence. <laughs> Margaret Rossiter, analysis of women scientists in America, breaks from this mold by shifting the focus from the exceptional woman to the more usual patterns of women working in science. And I'm just gonna like, highlight that word retains to the male norm as the measure of excellence Boy. <clears throat> Evelyn Fox Keller though she retains the focus on an exceptional woman in her biography of Barbara McClintock does not simply measure McClintock's ow, um, against traditional male standards, but uses her story told largely in McClintock's own words as a vehicle for evaluating current methods of experimental science. Hmm. Today we understand to a large extent how women have been excluded from scientific institutions that despite efforts made through affirmative action, Whew, I'm out of breath. The problem of women's limited presence in science has not disappeared. In recent years, scholars from a variety of dis uh, disciplines have con concentrated on the problem, explaining the deeper mechanisms of exclusion. Sociologists and historians have identified structural barriers in both society and the institutions of science that have impeded women's professional advancement. Biologists have begun to unravel the myths of gender embedded in the female body. Philosoph philosophers and historians have begun to define gender-based distortions in the norms and practices of science and to discuss alternative epistemologies for the sciences. And I don't know that word. 
you know? What can I say? <laughs> Can't really say anything, actually. <laughs> Truth, belief, and justification. I like that word. Um, I This Burgoing literature has focused attention on how sexual differences have been cultivated by society's intent upon preserving sharp social and intellectual distinctions between the sexes. But what are the origins and implication of those differences? Should differences be celebrated or overcome? Are men and women different, different by nature or nurture? And what differences... What difference does difference make? I think differences should, should be celebrated, but also overcome, you know? I don't know. Understanding gender differences and how they operate in the world of science today requires a re-examination of the history of women in science. What role did women question? What role did the women woman question? and the debate over female nature play in the origin of modern science. In the following pages, I shall, I, shall be, I shall be examining the revolution in European science that took place in the 17th and 18th century and the place of gender in that revolution. I have analyzed the problem into four student parts, institutional organizations, individual biographies, scientific definitions of female nature, and cultural meanings of gender. Do, 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 do. I look forward to reading that actually. Cultural meanings of gender, what culture though? There's so many. Rather than privilege any one of these as casual agents, I see them as interdependent parts of a dynamic system. My purpose is to bring together elements of what are sometimes seen as different historical methods, each of which is crucial for understanding women's place in scientific culture. Ooh. My purpose is to bring together elements of what are some of them. The first part of the study looks at the institutions of science as agencies mediating between science and society with a focus on how gender boundaries are were negotiated in universities and scientific academies of the 17th century. Medieval universities were closed to all but a few exceptional women. Medieval, oh, I'm sorry, modern science arising outside of and in opposition to medieval university was fostered in academies, princely courts, Parisian salons, and the uh, artis artis artisanal workshop that is in a social landscape expansive enough to include a number of women. Chapter one argues that in this period, it was not at all oblivious that women would be excluded from the new institutions of science. The second part concentrates on women as historical actors, maneuvering within the gender boundaries prescribed by society. Hmm. A number of women experimented in early modern Europe with the limits of convention in order to secure their place among the men of science. Chapters two, three, and four tell the stories of, of some of them. My method here is comparative. The diversity among women should not be ignored. Women's particip participation in science varied greatly from country to country, class to class, and town to town. Women scientists in this period came predominantly from two social groups, the aristocracy and the crafts. 
Chapter two looks at England and France where the greatest contributions came from women, the aristocracy. Is that how you say it? I don't care. Noble women gained a limit, limited access to science in the 17th century and 18th centuries, much as they had access to political power and influence by virtue of their noble status. In Germany, chapter 3, by contrast, women's scientific activities were prompted by their involvement in craft production. The strength of the artisanary in Germany may explain the remarkable fact that between 1650 and 1720, a sizable portion, six out of 42, of German astronomers were women. Hmm. <clears throat> in chapter four, I shift the focus to women's tradition and science. Women's traditionally dominated the field of midwifery, for example, but with the scientific and social revolutions of the 17th and 18th centuries, the man midwife came to encroach upon the ancient monopoly. Finally, chapter nine traces the lives of some women in science at the close of this era. But the 19th century women were effectively barred from the new institutions of science and restricted to the increasingly private sphere of the family where they served as invisible assistants to brothers, husbands, and fathers. That's literally like everything right there. Everyone women were invisible assistants for men and still are sometimes i'm sure <sighs> bastards. Bastards. Um. Mm -hmm. the third part examines how the biological sciences have read and misread sex and gender no real distinction was made by 18th century anatomist. Yeah, I think that's how you say it. <laughs> In women's bodies and how these scientific readings of female nature were used to argue for, for or against the partic participation of women in science. Chapter six sets the stage by sketching the cosmological assumptions behind definitions of sex and gender in the ancient regime of science. <clears throat> One might expect dramatic changes in understanding of women's place in society and nature during the tumultuous years of the scientific revolution, a revolution which itself arose as part and parcel of larger movements towards participatory, participatory democracies. We find, however, the modern science strident in its claims to displace the old was curiously silent on the issue of gender. Not until deep into the 18th century did scientists, especially anatomist undertake a thorough going reform of definitions of sexuality. What in chapter seven I describe as scientific rev revolution in views of sexual difference. The fourth part explores cultural meanings of femininity and masculinity and however understandings of gender became embedded in debates over women's ability to do science. I'm interested in that. One idea explored in this book is the femininity represents a set of values that have been excluded from science. Yet it is important to understand that femininity itself is profoundly historical. Chapter five examines how notions of gender often refer as much to the manners of a particular class or a particular nation as to those of a particular sex through two examples. The rise and fall of feminine images of science and the battles over intellectual style played out in salons of Paris. Chapter eight goes on to explore how the theory of sexual complementary, excuse me, justified purging both women and what came to be defined as feminine from the public world of science. Chapter 10, by, the, by way of conclusion, examines the reinforcing 
character of the gender system in science. Scientists help crystallize gender roles by constr uh, constructing views of men and women that bolstered emergent I ideas of masculinity and femininity. Yet science and philosophy did not do so from a privileged vantage point untouched by social struggle. Science was itself part of the terrain that divided the sexes. Ultimately, we must ask, what were the consequences of exclusion of women from the methods and priorities of science? Though my focus is on women in the origins of modern science, my hope is that this book will also shed light on how gender relationships have molded and continue to mold scholarship and knowledge more generally. The nature of science is, the nature of science is no more fixed than the social relations relations of men or women. Science too is shaped by social forces. One of those forces has been the persistent effort to distance science from women and the feminine. Shedding light on the origins of these efforts may help to add historical understanding to the problems of gender and science facing us today. And this was written in 1989. Was it? Or 1991, I don't know. One of those. <clears throat> And uh, I would get into the next chapter, but this is, this is like hard for me to pronounce, like having difficulty, but very interesting. I mean, I'm not surprised at all. I mean, I live that life, right? So anyways, um, great book, prefer it to the other one you have chosen to remember. I'm actually going to send that as a gift to someone because I don't really feel like there's anything that I need to read. Um, Hmm, interesting. I just opened the book up and I found this picture of a man and a woman working ooh, shit, working together. Um, in Germany. Danzig, is that Germany? I think so. Um, sounds like it. Is that also a name of a band? Let me see if they have more information. Very cool though. Um, they have imagery, like old, old timey illustrations, and I, I really like that. That's part of the reason why I got this book. What else is here? Let's look. Ba -da -da -ba -ba. Hmm. Oh boy. Interesting. So there's a drawing 
an illustrated drawing of the human anatomy, like the skeleton. Um, this one is male, but I like I like the picture and make a cool poster. Shit, just lost my bookmarks. But uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. It's, it has an angel in the background. And then I saw this one. Um, I lost the chapter we were on, but that's okay. And this one caught my eye because of the writing. It's it's German, but I can't read it. Um, and then there's a long German sentence that I'm not going to bother reading, but um, it has the gods, Diana, Ceres, however you say her name. Cool. I'll show it to you. It's, it's pretty nice. <laughs> oh, wow. We have three people. <laughs> Ironically, Ro Rocky, I understand where you're getting at. <laughs> but yeah, um, this is German, but I can't read it. So, like, I literally can't read. Make it out. And what else do we have here? We have some naked women, <clears throat> you know, and those are pretty much it, the images, but yeah, we're going to read this. Uh, what is this? Masculine Eason, Hermaphrodite, manly woman, manly woman, womanish man, womanish man. Oh, interesting. Never seen that before. Anyways, this book. Hmm. Is actually really awesome. Harvard. I'm reading a Harvard book. <laughs> Anyways, uh, what else can we we do? Because uh, it's it's gonna rain. Just like stalling or something. So, anyways, <clears throat> the mind has no sex. Um, women and men, or masculine and feminine energies, are needed to balance themselves um, because a society filled with just men. I can't imagine what it's like. I, I think it would get kind of boring after a while um, because you would just be constantly surrounded by the same mindset. Um, what was I going to do? So yes, having both male and female energies, awesome. And important, and that's why spiritual spirituality is preferable when explaining the importance of <clears throat> why we need female and male at balance. Um, what the heck was I doing? Oh, yes. I Sorry, because right now we have high, uh, as the book says, it's been really high male-dominated culture, and it's not balanced, and that needs to be balanced um, for progression to happen, obviously, and just, um, you know, equality and justice, but, you know... I'm just a girl in the world. Um, but 
but the ironic thing about this whole situation, right? Like you, uh, men literally like will demean women. Women, I don't know, I'm speaking with an accent. They literally want to demean women. They want to talk down about them, but then they get married and they have children with these women, right? You wouldn't have anything without women. You wouldn't even be in existence without women. And yet you want to blithe. I don't know why I'm thinking of blithe. What is blithe? I got it. I that word that word just came to me. <laughs> I've never used it before. Blythe. careless I guess <clears throat> you know like carelessly saying all this stuff about women and then like not realizing or not caring that you would not be in existence without someone pushing you out of their body in a painful manner um but that's okay if they want to be ignorant and disrespectful that's going to bite them in the ass eventually Essentially, I see it as, because I was mentioning that women are waking up, you know, they're not taking any bullshit. So the more women wake up and become woke, we're just going to use that word, um, they're not going to put up with the bullshit of an inferior man, right? So all these men that have this mindset that women are lesser and we don't need women and blah, blah, blah. They're useless. They're only for cooking and, you know, typical bullshit. Um, they're not going to have anyone to have sex with unless it's someone who, you know. Um, and that's good. Let them die out. Let that lineage die. I'm not trying to be mean, you know, you know what I mean? <clears throat> because why I keep bringing these people with this the same bullshit mindset that doesn't benefit anyone except for the rich white man. And we have seen what that, ha what happens, uh, <laughs> and it ain't good all right so we're gonna do something we're gonna finish some muksha stuff because this paper's here i was thinking of a song before <clears throat> i mean if you don't like women you don't respect women then don't put your did I make this 18 blue? Don't put your dick in a woman, okay? Just use your hand. We don't need you. Um, you know what I mean? Was that harsh? I don't care. <laughs> Yeah, so like, I mean, come on. I wish, um, I wish vagina dentata was like a physical feature that every woman was capable of having. 
Um, if you haven't seen that movie, you should watch it. Um, it's basically vagina teeth. And I think that would be beneficial for everyone to evolve into that, you know? Um, <clears throat> I would, I, I find that handy actually. Yeah. Where'd it go? I just saw it. Yeah. I'm going to draw a picture. So yeah, so uh, vagina dentata. Just, you know, just evolve into to that. for peace to come to everyone. Um, peace has to come into a single person's heart. Because you carry the scars that made you and you inflict those wounds on other people, you know? I don't know what's going on here, but I gotta do some smaller stars doo, 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 doo. okay so i just drew a little picture of of a jar with some stars and uh, i'm just gonna write make a wish <laughs> i don't know um something cute That's why it's not. Yeah, sure. Make a wish. Bam. That's one. What else should we do? Anyways, um, yeah, so in order for peace to come, which is totally possible. You know, I always believed in it for a very long time, even though people would tell me it's impossible. And I was like, nothing is impossible. I'm such an optimist. Um, so yeah, I don't know what else to do. That book hurt my brain. It didn't hurt my brain, I just hurt to say those big words. You know, uh, let's see, what else, what else is this? I can't understand this person's writing.
don't even know sometimes. I don't even know. Uh, because I'm an artist, I had to study anatomy. And the difference between women and men are the shape of their torso going down to their waist, their hips. Men are slimmer, you know, and women have wider hips. And that's because we bear children. <clears throat> and that's what makes us irresistible, you know. Um, but in that book, people were saying that women's bodies were like children's bodies. And I was just like, the fuck? Sometimes I don't know what goes through people's heads. Crazy. But yeah, so anatomy wise, do I have any anatomy books handy? I'm going to go get some actually. Uh, well, anyways, so we have to study this book, and I have several, the Atlas Anatomy for Artists, I have several anatomy books, because it's fascinating, um, but let's see, this was made in, 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 when was this published? This is old, let's just say that. <laughs> And it's also German origin, which I didn't know that. But look at the, this, these illustrations are just like freaking amazing. I had to draw all this, learn all, it, all of it. It was so tedious. Where's the difference between... This one's focusing mainly on men. Why? Okay, whatever. Yeah, this is why I had to buy another one because it was only men. So yes, um, the, the illustrations are just really nice. Like I, I love them. Fritz Scheider. I should have known from his name that this was German. But yes, uh, hips are the difference. Hips don't lie. You know, it's, it's just... I'm not saying that male anatomy isn't beautiful. Uh, as an artist, I appreciate all beauty. You know what I mean? <clears throat> but I do think that women should be worshipped, you know, as the goddesses that they are, because literally, like, we could end your life. Like, we could end your existence. You know? Like, if we shut down the baby factory, what are you gonna do? Huh? Just saying, like, what are, you, what are you gonna do? Like, your species would die out. <laughs> so anyways, yes. Um, That's pretty much it. Nothing, nothing else to read for now. <clears throat> what else do we have? No, 
That's very much. I don't want to read anything else because I want to focus. I need to finish one book at a time instead of being spread out. Well, except for the art game design, I like going back and forth because they relate. And the American education book, I have not forgotten about that. But I think I'm putting it on the back burner for now. <laughs> but yeah, so mm, interesting. Anatomy. And the whole thing with uh, with culture, with certain cultures, right? In Saudi Arabia, before, I think it was in the 70s, 70s, 80s, uh, women could dress however they wanted. And then the regime changed. And all of a sudden, it was about covering yourself and hoarding yourself and uh, being subservient to the male figure in your family because it's not only the husband, it's also the father that they have to obey. <clears throat> and uh, partially due to the fact that women who are highly educated are dangerous. Not in a physical, but in an educational manner. But whatever. Um, you know, you can't stop it. Can't stop evolution. At all. You know, like, it, 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 it just, you can't. Stop and feel in your body how great it feels when you give and receive. You raise your frequency, accept, expect more good things to come your way. Nice. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. Um, I want to see if this book, if she rewrote it right now before I leave before I disappear into the storm. Holy hell, what? So her book is 29 to $38 and I got it for a dollar. <laughs> And she hasn't written anything actually. So, huh? Lucky I didn't have to spend that much money to get that. <laughs> thrifting. Okay. So yes. Um. Yeah. Mm. Interesting reads. I think I I I have good taste in books. I hope people agree. But yeah. Psh. Awesome. Um, I realized. Did I take a shower today? No. Anyways, uh, <laughs> and for the the mind has no sex. Oh yes, it does all the time. Mm -hmm. I agree. <laughs> 